You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The Federal Judicial Center presents Science in the Courtroom, a series of programs for judges on science and scientific evidence. Program 3, Markman Issues in Biotech Patent Cases, a discussion moderated by the Honorable Fern M. Smith, Director of the Federal Judicial Center. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the third program in our series, Science in the Courtroom. In this program, we'll address a number of thorny legal and practical issues resulting from the Supreme Court's holding in Markman versus Westview Instruments. We'll discuss these issues in the context of biotech patent cases, and perhaps learn a bit more about microbiology along the way. But much of what we say will be applicable to the entire range of patent cases. Joining me for today's discussion are Judge Paul Michel of the Federal Circuit, Attorney Leora Benami, a partner with the firm Clifford Chance Rogers and Wells in New York, Judge Patty Saris of the District of Massachusetts, and Judge Roderick McKelvey of the District of Delaware. Let's begin with you, Judge Michel, if we may. And would you explain for us generally the Supreme Court's holding in Markman and what this does for the, to the responsibility of the trial courts? Well, the court held that construing patent claims, much like construing statutory language, is a question of law, is for the judge, not the jury, and is independently or freely reviewable on appeal. So it put a great burden on judges, particularly since patent claims have to be construed from the standpoint of people in the particular art or technological field. And of course, then the jury needs to be instructed by the court uh, as to the meaning of the disputed claim terms. Okay. And Ms. ben -Ami, you've litigated a number of these cases. Um, and while the Supreme Court made clear the legal obligation uh, for the trial court, it really didn't address the procedural right. issues at all. Uh, what have you found in going around the country uh, that courts are doing in terms of scheduling and procedural matters? Honestly, they're all over Honestly. the lot. Honestly, okay. And, and it can be helpful to understand uh, what people are doing. Some judges do Markman hearings in the middle of discovery. Some do them at the end of discovery. There are some judges who do them as part of a summary judgment, and some do them as part of the pretrial. Still other judges will do them at the charging conference right before the jury comes in to deliberate. Some judges will do them purely on the papers. Others will have hearings like a summary judgment hearing, and still others have an evidentiary hearing like a mini trial. So it really is very, very different depending on where you are. Okay, now where you are, Judge Saris, is in Massachusetts, and you've had a fair number of patent cases. What do you do in terms of scheduling Markman hearings, and what kind of timing do you think is appropriate? Well, the first place to address the timing is at the Rule 16 scheduling conference. And I pull the attorneys in and I say, what about Markman? Do we have issues of claim construction? And often they say, we're not sure, or we're not sure how many claims. So they come in with lots of claims, and then they can boil it down. So we sit down right there at the Rule 16 conference and, and schedule in the Markman hearing. Uh, I find, in general, the time it works the best is at the end of discovery, at the end of fact and expert discovery, is to schedule that Markman hearing in conjunction with the summary judgment motions. In that way, I have a sense of the big picture. What are the defenses? What are the issues here? The attorneys have really focused so they can boil down the number of claims that are actually in dispute. And at that point, it's far enough before trial so that I can figure out the difficult technology and the parties can then prepare for trial in light of what I've ruled. The only downside is you sometimes need to have the summary judgment motions rebriefed because they're like mm -hmm. ships moving in the night. They essentially uh, are not addressing the claim as you've construed it. So sometimes you need some rebriefing, but you need to give yourself enough time to be able to write the Markman opinion and explain how you came to the construction that you got to, particularly if it's a hotly disputed claim. Okay, and would you, do you find that the procedure you've just described works equally well for non-biotech cases as far as timing? Well, actually, it's amazing to me. I, every once in a while, get a patent that I can actually understand without any help, and uh, that's some basic, straightforward technology. 
And, and sometimes even there, there's an issue of, of claim mm -hmm. construction, and the attorneys will say, just settle this, just figure out what this um, claim means, and, and we can maybe settle this dispute. So there I'll move it forward, and I'll try and do it earlier on. But the, the beauty of waiting on a very difficult case, like a patent case or a computer case or something like that, is, is that way I can learn the technology. I'm the one who only had biology my freshman year in college. I haven't done a lot of the science in a really mm -hmm. long time. So I want to make sure I can get up to speed in the technology. Judge McKelvey, probably no court has a higher percentage of patent cases than the District of Delaware, and you in particular have had a lot, and I know your court has some established procedural rules. Do you uh, agree generally with Judge Saris on timing, or do you have a different point of view? I, I actually do mine a little bit later. I do my claim construction mm -hmm. now. I set aside a day where I do pretrial conference in the morning, claim construction in the afternoon, then hear summary judgment arguments after that. And that's all about four to six weeks before the jury trial. So it's probably a couple of, little, couple of weeks later in the process than Judge Saris does it. I tried it during the trial, found that very hard on both the judge and the lawyers, hard because I want to take the time to think about claim construction mm -hmm. and read the file history, and I found that just hard to do. I tried to do claim construction earlier in the trials and found that also very hard to do earlier in the case, meaning in the middle of discovery. I found that just too difficult to do. I didn't understand enough about the case. So I, I've, I've settled in right now mm -hmm. on cases, including in biotech cases, trying to do it all in one day at the claim construction. And as I understand... At the pretrial enough. Okay. And as I understand it, Delaware um, tries uh, very hard and is pretty consistent about setting the trial date within 12 months after a case is we filed. We try. There's a little slippage, but we try to uh -huh. try to schedule a case so that it gets to trial within 12, 14, 15 months of the filing of the complaint. Okay. Uh, Ms. Benami, do you find uh, that the general procedures discussed by Judges McKelvey and Saris are fairly universal, or what do you see around the country uh, generally in terms, especially in, in differentiating between biotech cases and non-biotech mm -hmm. cases? I think in, in biotech cases, the judges need more help. You need to get more background because, as Judge Saris said, most judges haven't had a lot of mm -hmm. biology. Mm -hmm. and it was quite a while ago. So people don't have the background to feel comfortable. Uh, and what I, I like to say is there are various ways to do Markman hearings, but there needs to be what I call a period of intensity where you can get that tutorial. Uh, Judge McKelvey has tutorial tapes made uh, by the parties where they explain the issues, or a tutorial, live tutorial, or some means so that the judge feels comfortable that they're just not acting in a vacuum. Uh, I think that's very important for the courts. Do you have a lot of judges now requesting tutorials, either live or by tape? Almost everyone now. Good. Well, I think apparently we're all learning mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. as we go along. Um, Judge Michelle, unfortunately, a number of these cases wind up at your court sooner or later. All of them, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and as you're reviewing the record, do you notice any difference uh, that timing makes uh, in the, the dispute, or do you have a sense of what might be optimal? Uh, I agree with what uh, the judges uh, here have said, that after a fair amount of discovery, but well before trial is the, the optimal zone, I think it varies some from one case to the next. That's probably why uh, we didn't try to stipulate any procedures, mm -hmm. including uh, on timing. And I think uh, it's very interesting, uh, the stress put on getting comfort with a period of intensity and then also doing the analysis carefully in writing. Because when it does come to us uh, on appeal, which most cases do, claim construction is always one of the issues. And even though the nominal standard of review is de novo, we really don't start from scratch and construe the claims ourselves. We review the claim construction reasoning as explained by the district judge in the opinion. So having a clear line of reasoning there is enormously helpful. Do you get um, any sense in looking at these records as to what proportion of judges are doing Markman hearings at any given time, I mean, early, yes. late? 
I, I think that it seems that uh, every, almost everybody somehow connects it with summary judgment. We uh -huh. now see a great many cases uh, where there's a grant of summary judgment and hence a pretrial appeal. So there is uh, an opportunity and a requirement really for us to review the correctness of the claim construction before the case uh, goes to trial. And so it seems like everybody has it pegged pretty close to summary judgment. There are lawyers who press to have claim construction done early in a case. Frequently, a defendant will ask to have it done early. Um, and in-house counsel will say that it can save a lot of money if we'll do claim construction early. I'll ask lawyers if they want to do claim construction mm -hmm. early. If they both agree, we'll try to do it early. Sometimes it helps in discovery disputes, understanding what the claims will mean. What do you do if one party gives you a pretty convincing argument that an early uh, claim construction would be useful and the other party adamantly protests, do you go with your feeling that it makes I'll, sense? I'll, I'll stay with my pretrial conference time. It happens that defendants will come in and say, you don't need discovery mm -hmm. on the infringing product or process or tell us what the claim constructions mean first. And I'll allow a, a plaintiff to take discovery on the infringing product or process before we do claim construction. So I'll, my default mode is to stick with the pretrial conference. Okay. Um, judge Michelle, do you see many cases where the uh, judge has ad adopted neither party's uh, proffered claim construction, but instead comes up with his or her own version of what the claims mean? Uh, we, we see some of that. Uh, usually it's uh, more partial. Mm -hmm. There may be certain uh, points on which one side's uh, proposed construction was adopted by the trial judge, uh, maybe uh, on a few points the other side, and m once in a while uh, uh, a sort of a third uh, approach uh, by the trial judge uh, themselves, but, but, but usually it's fairly uh, clear cut on the critical uh, claim terms that really drive the infringement uh, summary judgment decision. As, as a lawyer, uh, Ms. Benami, how would you feel if um, you weren't going to get the claim construction until during the trial? And then the judge appeared on the bench and announced that the claim construction, in fact, was not what you'd asked for, nor what the other side had asked for, but was a whole new creature. You can imagine how <laughs> <laughs> the truth is it just leads to confusion. Mm -hmm. One of the goals of, of both the judges and the lawyers, and there is a consistency here, we want to try to think, keep things simple for the jury to the extent we can. And when we have to argue the technology and the alternative, how the claims meet the products in the alternative, it just leads to a great deal of uncertainty for the jury. Experts will have to talk about things in the alternative. And then if at the end the judge picks which claim construction he prefers, the judge may have been deciding the credibility of the experts, and the jury finds out. So it just creates a lot of extra problems that I don't think are particularly useful for anybody in this situation. Mm -hmm. Well, I know you've had cases before Judge McKelvey, before Judge Saris, before me yes. when I was in San Francisco, and before a lot of other um, judges, given the fact that judges are all over the lot. From the standpoint of the litigants and the lawyers, what do you think is the maximum uh, time mm -hmm or the best time to hold a hearing? I think that, for me, I would like it a little bit earlier than the pretrial because I'd like to be able to refocus my expert reports. And I have a okay. case in front of Judge McKelvey, so I'll be happy to do it <laughs> at the pretrial <laughs> also. But I think that if, you, if it's a little bit before the pretrial, it allows the parties to figure out if they need to do anything mm -hmm. else in light of the claim construction. But it has to be well into the case unless it's an unusual case. But one of the advantages of the pretrial is I'm you get trouble. this refocusing and it mm -hmm. ends up being what I call the whack-a-mole approach, which mm -hmm. is that once the judge does claim construction, the parties will refocus and you'll do new claim construction and new claim construction. So one of the advantages of doing it late but before the trial is then the lawyers can't change their position and it forces the lawyers and the experts to come in with expert reports that deal with all of the potential claim construction so there's not a lot of shifting of ground afterwards so this is a little bit of a, a benefit to the judge and a detriment to the lawyers in, in terms mm -hmm. of timing. Do you allow the, the, sh the theory of shifting sands in claim construction? Well, it, 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 in two, of course I do because I want to get it right Judge Michelle. <laughs> it, it, as a trial judge you say you want to get it right and if a party comes back and shifts it's difficult because you can't just 
put it aside. But, but I think the best thing to do is to force the lawyers to deal with what the different options are going to be and then do a claim construction decision. Now, one of the complications is you can pick one from A, one from B, uh -huh, one mm -hmm. from C, and then the lawyers will a little unclear about it. Okay, mm -hmm. briefly, Judge Saris, you want to conclude with... Uh... Well, I think from a judge's point of view, uh, the problem with Markman is it really has turned potentially um, a summary judgment hearing into two separate hearings. Mm -hmm. You have the Markman sure. hearing, you construe the claim, and then there's a summary judgment hearing. And there's the horror that we all face of seeing these huge briefs mm -hmm. and, and having to write two separate opinions, which takes a long time. So I think our goal is should be to try and um, condense as much as possible the Markman into at least the summary judgment, if not the pretrial, so that you're not delaying by three and six months the time it takes to write each one of the opinions. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to do. Well, that's helpful, Judge Saris. We've come to the end of this segment. We'll be back in a moment. Judge McKelvey, Judge Saris has told us she doesn't have a science background. Do you? No, actually in economics is my Okay. Degree. So how do you prepare for one of these hearings once you've decided when to hold them? What do you do to get ready? Well, first, I, I don't set a particular structure for the lawyers. I suggest that they reach an agreement on briefing and filing papers mm -hmm. before the claim construction hearing. Then I ask them for a couple of papers. As I mentioned, I have the pretrial order already. I ask the lawyers to give me a copy of the file history so I can read it. I asked the lawyers to give me a videotape early on in the case so that I have a sense of what the technology is during the course of discovery. And then I also have the briefing on the summary judgment motions. And so those documents all together, I'll sit down a couple of days before the pretrial conference, go through them, and they pretty much get me to the point where I think I understand what's going on with the technology and prepared for the hearing. Um, that it will take place usually the afternoon of the pretrial conference. Do you give the parties any parameters about the videotape, for example? Do you tell them you want animation, you want a lecture, or do you leave it up There's to a them? A couple of things to it. One, I include in my initial scheduling order the requirement that the parties prepare and file. We'll talk during the initial conference about it. Some parties are a little reluctant because it's expensive to prepare. Mm -hmm. I basically tell them I use this to educate myself, educate law clerks. I use it for a transition for law clerks each year that come in in August or September to find out what's going on in their cases. So that the parameter basically is if you think it's going to be helpful for me, that's fine. Usually they're filed under seal and I treat them as if they're a brief. It can be a lawyer talking, it can be animation. Generally the things that are most helpful for me are the pictures. I find that the pictures help educate me as lawyers draw pictures about the technology. It, it brings me up to speed much more quickly than trying to uh, pour through the briefs, or at least it helps me pour through the briefs. Okay, and Judge Saris, um, I know you and, and Ms. Ben-Ami had a case together. Uh, what kinds of things did you ask her and opposing counsel to do to help you get ready in that case? Well, I knew I was in trouble when the first thing that the parties gave me were two huge textbooks being used at Harvard <laughs> Medical School. And I said to them, I'm the one who went to law school, not med mm -hmm. school. And I, t I took a read through the summary judgment motions at some point and the motions preliminary injunction. I said, I don't really understand this. Mm -hmm. I just fundamentally don't understand the technology. So what I asked the parties to do, and they were terrific at doing it, was to teach me. And uh, I found it most useful to be taught as I was having a private tutorial. They each brought in professors from some of our area uh, schools, and some of them were undergraduates, not necessarily postdoc uh, undergraduate professors, like there was a professor from Wellesley College, there was one from MIT, and they came in and they taught me. And they started at the beginning, DNA, and they worked all the way through. And uh, I found that that gave me the tools to even understand the legal arguments and to understand the technology because, after all, it was cutting-edge Nobel Prize winning technology. So the other thing is I can't emphasize enough this use of videotapes because I forget things. You're on to a criminal case. You're on to a securities sure. fraud case. You're mm -hmm. on to other things. And you forget when you're writing. And I would sit there just re replaying and rewinding the tapes. You know, what's the technology? What is the, the uh, issue here and so that a month down the road while you're writing it up if you say gee I don't really understand that you can go back so I think it's important of the videotapes I love being taught in court and being able to ask questions and finally I found it was useful I actually went back to those Harvard Medical School treatises just to understand mm -hmm. basic term definitions and I, I found if you have that we all know how to learn and and they can teach you how to learn and, and that was an important piece for me in that case okay. we'll never get those books back will we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still hoping one of my kids goes to med school so Miss ben -Ami, is that the procedure you tend to follow in educating mm -hmm. most judges I think there are a few ways that it's done right now uh, 
oftentimes judges will say, come together and find a mutual expert, just to give us a tutorial. Mm -hmm. But then it's a pure tutorial. Uh, other times they'll say, each one of you bring in an expert, and each one can give a tutorial. That'll be more focused on what the issues are in a case, because a pure tutorial will not necessarily say, and this is where the dispute is. A focused tutorial might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Other times the lawyers will do a tutorial. It's our job to explain the technology to the jury ultimately, and the lawyers should be able to explain the technology to the judges. But one way or the other, I say most judges want a tutorial. And are they typically on the record, off the record, both ways? Both ways. Both ways. People are doing it all different ways. Okay. Um, Judge Michelle, when you see um, these cases coming, coming up to you from your perspective, I mean, you've heard what, what Judge Saris and Judge McKelvey do to get ready, and obviously they look at a variety of extrinsic material and intrinsic material. What do you think the trial judge ought to be looking at and how should the trial judges be using those materials? Well first I think uh, to get the background about the invention and the technology itself the trial judge should make use of any sort of sor source that seems useful expert witnesses, textbooks, anything. Um, with respect however to construing the actual disputed words and phrases in the claim that are likely to drive mm -hmm. the infringement finding uh, they have to be a little more careful. There's a cardinal rule that you cannot contradict clear meaning in a patent claim on the basis of, for example, of the testimony of an expert witness. Uh, and there is also a sort of a hierarchy of preferred sources where the claim at issue is perhaps first on the list and then next the surrounding claims and next the written description and then the drawings and then the prosecution history and maybe cited prior art and so on down until you finally get to the uh, expert witness who came into the case uh, long after the patent issued and that of course has the problem that competitors can only look to the patent to know what's forbidden and what's permitted and therefore testimony that arose only in the course of litigation wasn't available to warn anybody and so that's the least preferred source but if none of the other sources will adequately illuminate the understanding in the relevant art at the relevant time of a particular term then as a last resort the testimony is uh, perfectly permissible provided it doesn't contradict clear meaning discernible from the patent documents itself. Okay, all right, thank you. And Judge McKelvey, within that framework, what do you do to get inside and in, in, into the specific disputed terms? Um, and and um, you know, how do you winnow the large number or what appears to be the large number of disputes down to something that's manageable? Actually, the lawyers end up doing that. They'll arrive uh, with the case early on and may not have a sense of how many uh, claims are going to be an issue. I do a couple of things in terms of trial management. One, just in terms of getting the case to the jury, I'll force the lawyers, if I can, to eliminate certain patents or certain claims so that we have a certain representative group if there seems to be too many. Second, I found that in the Markman briefing, that is the briefing before the hearing, that the lawyers will find out that they don't disagree on certain terms. So I've even had, during the course of Markman hearings, lawyers say, oh, I didn't understand that uh, we agreed on this term or those mm -hmm. terms. And then they'll uh, essentially get it down to the two, three, four terms that the judge will have to resolve the dispute between the parties. Okay. And do you hold um, your tutorials, or I guess... I do videos uh -huh. early. And do you, but do you have a separate tu tutorial segment? And if so, do you have it on or no, off I the record? No, I do. I, I receive the videos early on in the case. Mm -hmm. And then for the Markman hearing, I just tell the lawyers, you've got two hours, you can put on what you like. I have found that since Vitronics and Pitney Bowes, the two Federal Circuit cases, lawyers have been very reluctant to put on extrinsic evidence. But I invite them to put on uh, evidence about the infringing product or process, bring in expert witnesses that they'd like to. Lately, I've found that what's happening is the lawyers are coming in and presenting argument. They do, in essence, the tutorial on the technology, the tutorial to get me up to speed on what the terms are that are in dispute and how they believe I should decide it one way or the other. Okay. It's rare now that I get witnesses during Markman hearings. 
You know, the, uh, it, it fascinates me that neither of you have a particularly scientific background, uh, nor do I, nor do the majority of judges on the federal circuit. So we have to do a similar learning experience for purposes of claim construction to what you've done uh, in the pretrial phase. And we depend primarily on the lawyers uh, and on the district judge's opinion, as opposed to um, more technical or scientific treatises or things of that sort. That's very interesting because I think a lot of people assume that virtually everybody on the federal circuit has a PhD in some very esoteric science. So it's comforting to know that you have to struggle the same way we all, <laughs> all do. Um, Judge Saris, do you find, as, as Judge McKelvey does, that there are fewer and fewer cases in which testimony is being offered or do you, are your cases different in some way? Well, the area in which testimony is being offered is where there's a dispute, as there often is, as to what people of ordinary skill in the art at the time of the invention would have construed a claim mm -hmm. to mean. And that's the toughest area, I find, in general in the Markman hearings, because sometimes you have wonderful experts on, on each end. You, we sometimes call them bookends, and they just happen to disagree. They're, they're not hired guns. They disagree as to what 1979 a term meant. And to give another example from this one biotech case, there was a dispute about what the term gene fragment meant. And it was not a defined term in the patent. The uh, literature cited in the patent and the, and the pictures gave an ambiguous picture as to whether, what exactly it meant, in my opinion. So I had to go to extrinsic evidence, which is a less preferred kind of evidence. And there was actually a dispute between two leading people as to whether it meant a single-stranded DNA molecule or a double-stranded DNA molecule, mm -hmm. which was important to one of the main issues in the case. I had hired a court-appointed neutral expert, um, a, a woman whom both sides agreed on, and we did it on the record uh, to help me through it. And essentially what I said to each of them was, I didn't just want their opinion as to what it meant, but it was a show me. Show me mm -hmm. where, <laughs> give me an article where they used it as a single-stranded or a double-stranded. You know, Help me through this as to not just what you understood it to mean, but what did the community understand it to mean. And, and that's the toughest area. I think you do often need to go to extrinsic, but it's, it, it's got an unclear status yes, in these it, Markman hearings. It does, and maybe, uh, Judge Michelle, you can help clarify some of it. You wrote the Vitronics opinion, which is widely cited, and then uh, were also involved uh, in some of these other cases. Would you tell us what the current status <laughs> is, if you can, on Intrinsic versus extrinsic. Uh, I wrote uh, not only Vitronics, but also uh, a follow-on case called Pitney Bowes, so I guess I'm the, uh, pr the problem You're the target. <laughs> um, I think that uh, uh, the basic dichotomy between uh, extrinsic and intrinsic evidence is a, okay as a starting point, but it, it can end up being confusing. There's nothing inherently always wrong about extrinsic evidence, and there is no flat rule in our case law that uh, the construction has to be based entirely on intrinsic evidence. But there is a preference for intrinsic evidence because that's what the competitors could have gone to look uh, for at the time of patent issuance. And, and as I said, I, I think the best way to think of it is as a, a, a series of uh, a sequence of preferred sources, starting with the patent document and then working uh, downward from there as far as you need to go. Much as Judge Sarah said, uh, if you can settle it, uh, uh, the dispute can be settled from the face of the patent document, that's the way to do it. If it can't, then you have to go to whatever sources you can go to. I do think there's a great preference for sources that existed at the time and that were uh, widely available to the public, like a technical mm -hmm. dictionary or articles or patents of the time, as opposed to sheer opinion by experts. And I think the biggest thing to watch out for is who is the expert. Uh, we, there were, for a long time, we saw innumerable cases where the record was the testimony of a patent lawyer or a former patent commissioner construing uh, uh, technical terms in a patent when the law says it's supposed to be from the standpoint of the practitioner in that field, mm -hmm. not from a lawyer standpoint. So uh, I think a lot has to be uh, uh, thought about who are the legitimate witnesses, not only what is their ultimate source. Okay. Ms. Benami, as you go around um, the country, do you think this concept is clear 
uh, at the trial level, or do you see some confusion or at least difference among trial judges and their attitude towards intrinsic versus extrinsic? I think most judges right now feel that intrinsic evidence is safe and extrinsic evidence can lead to reversal. Mm -hmm. and it's just fair. I think we need to separate out what experts can do because there is a way that I think experts are very useful but it's still guiding you in the evidence that existed at the time. It's not useful necessarily for an expert to say this is just my opinion. I was there and I think this. What an expert can do that I think is very helpful for the court is to guide you through the intrinsic evidence. When it says this in the specification that the plasmid was made this and this and this way, well, yes, that's there. It's on the face of the document, but no one knows what it means. You still need someone technical to help you understand that. Go through the prosecution. What did the prior art mean? Go through the literature of the time. What did that mean at the time? and not necessarily say, well, it's just my opinion. And there, so there's a difference there. Okay. Well, one, of, one of the most neglected sources, I think, of, of, of claim construction are, are patents that are cited in the patent that's being enforced as being the relevant prior art. Because in a certain sense, they're almost incorporated by reference. And it's very convenient to uh, be guided through them uh, by the attorneys or by uh, somebody giving a tutorial. Because then you don't have to spend a lot of courtroom time hearing live testimony. You can sort of walk through the key phrases in those cited patents. One thing that happens is lawyers will tell you at Markman or before, there's certain things you can't hear, certain evidence that can't come in. For example, evidence as to the infringing product or process or testimony by experts. And I think that's a misreading about Vitronics and Pitney Bowes because I think it's very helpful for a judge to not just understand the technology but to understand the case or controversy. That is, why is it that these terms are in dispute and is it a genuine dispute or not? And so I don't think judges should limit what information lawyers can give them. They may want to limit what they rely on in terms of reaching a decision as they write out their opinion on claim construction. I think that's the key. Uh, we've never reversed a judge for what they admitted. We have reversed on a few occasions where they relied on extrinsic evidence to contradict rather clear meaning uh, discernible in the patent, but we've never reversed for what they admitted in order to get whatever benefit it had. Good. Well, that's comforting, uh, helpful, and uh, I'm sure that uh, reassuring to a lot of our audience. We'll be back in a moment with our next segment. Let's focus on the conduct of the hearing itself now. Judge McKelvey, in recent years, the courts, the trial courts, have been given not only the responsibility for construing patents, but also gatekeeping responsibility in ass assessing the reliability of expert testimony. Do you see these two cases crossing paths in, in patent? issues that come before you? See, very rarely do I see Daubert issues come up in patent infringement cases. Actually, the time I do see them come up is in the context of infringement issues where parties presenting testing uh -huh. expert testimony, but not in claim construction. My sense is patent lawyers are happier to do cross-examination at trial rather than try to knock an expert witness out early. Okay. Uh, Judge Michelle, you mentioned something about the gate judge's gatekeeping responsibility in uh, Pitney Bowles. Do you see this issue coming up at all in patent cases that you review? Certainly not the come ho kind of issue mm -hmm. because usually both experts have very, very good credentials. There, there's no equivalent of junk science. You don't see junk patent theories. Uh, so I, I just don't think that we, we have that kind of a problem. We really have a different problem which focuses more on what can you rely on and in what context rather than what can you listen to if it would be helpful to understand the technology or the invention or the background uh, of the lawsuit. And there it's, 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 a, it's not really a gatekeeping function. It's, it's the final step in the construction analysis. Uh, given that, let me let me turn to you then, um, Ms. Ben-Ami, and ask this. Uh, we don't have reliability problems. On the other hand, all of us have seen cases where you have two blue ribbon experts, wonderful credentials, and yet the bottom line is they disagree over the meaning of an important disputed term. Mm -hmm. How do you wind up with these dueling experts and what do you, what happens uh, is the best way to resolve them. 
Well, I think it, there are a few important points. Number one, it's rare in a patent case that you'll get an expert witness for either side that's completely off the reservation. They tend to be people with very high credentials. Number two, they don't tend to have black versus white differences. They tend to be gray. They're overlapping and then the fringes are a little bit different. And, and that's the problem for the judge, I think, is to tell who's being the strict constructionist, who's being the broader constructionist. And we have to remember, they're often going back 25 years in time mm -hmm. and reading articles and trying to say, how would that affect the community? Because you're not asking them what they thought. What would the community have thought? And that's really the difference. All right. Judge Saris, you've got a case before you. You've heard the testimony from these two experts, and this is the situation that you have. There's a critical term, and basically their answers are different, and it's up to you uh, to make the magic critical decision. How do you do it? Well, this is the toughest area in the Markman hearing. It, the, the law is uncertain on this uh, mm -hmm. subject and it's hard to figure out what exactly to say. It is not a question of burden of proof. This is at least theoretically a question of law. So you can't resolve it based on burdens of proof. Uh, you also are sort of treading in difficult territory when you start talking about credibility. I find this one more credible, this one less credible. At least on the few times, I don't have as many as Judge McKelvey, that I've had to come into this area. I think the safest is my statement before, which is show me, uh, which is finding an undisputed basis in the record for what the community was thinking at the time. That isn't always easy because it's often a, a, a new area. That's why it's a patent and a claimed invention. But if at least you can find not just what the opinions of the experts are, but, but where it exists in the generally available literature or patents, I think you're on pretty safe grounds. Uh, I think you're on the least safe grounds when you start turning it on credibility. Oh, I think that's true. Um, Judge Michelle, from the standpoint of the appellate court, however, when you look at it and say this is a question of law, is it correct that despite that there are certain factual underpinnings that the trial judge is simply going to have to deal with? Uh, I think the Supreme Court and our court has acknowledged that there's a factual aspect uh, of the underpinnings uh, and really just insisted that the final step is pure law mm -hmm. like statutory construction. But I don't think that credibility is very often the determinant. One good sort of a guide or default rule or tiebreaker uh, is if a particular proposed construction would leave the preferred embodiment described in the uh, written description outside the scope of the claim. That can't be right. So that's one one good beacon to, to navigate by. And I think that uh, uh, context is critically important. Uh, and the, the, the correct construction usually makes a lot of sense if you put it in the context of the whole patent, of the other claims, of consistent use of terms. And I think the best single set of show me documents are, are the particular patents and articles that are cited in the patent being asserted because they are close in context whereas other articles that could be mentioned by experts may be in a very different context even though in the same field of technology. Uh, Judge McKelvey, you'd mentioned the fact that you get fewer and fewer experts testifying now in, um, in Markman hearings, but for those judges who do, and, and based on your past experience, what do you do when the inventor is one of the experts and the inventor says, this is what I believe the term means, or this is what, you know, my opinion. Is he a lay witness? Is he an expert? Does he get more or less value because he's the inventor? Well, I look on the inventor, right, and I allow the inventor to come in and testify as one skilled in the art. Mm -hmm. I know there's some case law on it that says I have to be careful about the extent to which I rely on it. But I don't preclude a party from offering testimony from the inventor, in part because I don't know exactly what the inventor is going to say until I have a chance to hear the inventor and hear them on direct and on cross. But I'm pretty careful, in light of the Federal Circuit case, I'm pretty careful about the extent to which I'll cite and rely on the inventor in claim construction matters. Okay. Uh, something that judges are using uh, in different ways is the neutral expert or uh, the third party expert, or, I mean not a third party, but a, a neutral or outside expert. You've had some experience with that, Judge Saris. How did you use this process? 
Well, I found the technology so difficult. I wanted someone who was going to be neutral, mm -hmm. and the parties, luckily for me, agreed to pay for the expert because, to my knowledge, there's no separate pot of money sitting out there. So the parties here agreed to pay for the expert, and they agreed upon a person. It was a longer process than I thought because uh, different experts have ties to different organizations, but they agreed upon a neutral person, and uh, she wrote up, she's a postdoc, and she wrote up a report on her construction of the claims, and she helped me ask questions to some extent of, of the other experts uh, as to the basis for their opinion. That was the good news. The bad news was that uh, they wouldn't agree to let me do it off the record. Everything was on the record, and I was worried that, that it would be unfair for me to um, discuss with her in an ex parte kind of way what, what anything meant, or even just uh, some basic technology terms. So it was more stilted that way, and I think that the attorneys usually play an important role in teaching experts how to teach me, and no one taught this woman how to teach mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So she often talked at levels that were higher than my understanding, so that uh, it was not a perfect use of, uh, of, of an expert. I think I'd work on it a little differently. I think I'd twist arms a little more heavily to try at least have some ways for me to help her at least coach me. Uh, tell her how to get it down to, to, to a level of a non-scientist. But on the whole, I think that's um, a safer approach uh, unless you can get the parties to agree for ex parte communication because otherwise I, th I think there's some issues on um, the ex parte. Okay. Judge McKelvey, uh, have you had any experience in using either uh, a court-appointed expert, a technical advisor? If so, what's your view and how do you feel in particular about the ex parte issues. I, well, I haven't done it, and, no, and in no case have the lawyers asked me to do it. And I'd actually be very concerned about uh, ex parte communications with an expert. I, it makes me nervous, and I, and I know it makes the lawyers very nervous about the information I'm getting about the technology. So that, for example, we don't go head to the library very often to get technology books or other mm -hmm. information. I'm assuming the lawyers know what they want me to know, and because of uh, uh, having lawyers on each side, I assume they'll be able to educate me as to the matters and issues. So one, I don't do ex parte communications with experts, and two, on court appointed experts, I've had lawyers tell me that it just adds an, a layer of expense and uncertainty to a case that they are reluctant to ask me to do. So I actually haven't done either. I'm open to it. It may not sound like it, but I am. <laughs> if you uh, if you were, for whatever the reason, to go check some books out of the library, is that something you think needs to be disclosed? Uh, to the other side that you've looked at a particular reference book and even what pages you've scanned? If it's scanned. critical, I uh -huh. think it's fair. If it's critical, if I'm going to, certainly if I'm going to cite anything in an opinion and rely on it and tell the Federal Circuit, here's what I look to, I think it's very important to tell the lawyers because they could say right up, Judge, you're looking at the wrong year for the textbook. And I, so I think it's very important. But um, I haven't done that. And if it, if it did become critical, I certainly would tell the lawyers ahead of time before I relied on it. How about from the standpoint of the advocates, Ms. Benami, what has been your experience in having um, neutrals or other parties brought into the litigation? Well, um, I've had all different ways of this being done as well. In Judge Saris's case, we had a Rule 706 expert. And I think that if we did that again, it would be useful for the parties to get together and give a tutorial to the expert. Mm -hmm. This on was the, the law. same expert yes. Judge Saras had referred to. Because we have to be, the, the scientists are very good when they're in their labs. And now you bring them into a courtroom mm -hmm. and they're not on their turf. And it's not really fair to them to sit them down in a courtroom. They have no idea what lawyers are doing, they have no idea why the questions are relevant. Why are you focusing on 1984? Why are you focusing on what's in the patent documents as opposed to something else? And I think you need to give the scientist a tutorial so that they're just not a victim in this whole process. And well, that's not fair to the, to the scientist. Mm -hmm. um, I have had uh, technical experts who act as a technical clerk, for example, to the judge. Um, that is very difficult for the parties because there is no record of what is transpiring. And if it's impacting the judge in any way, there's no record for the parties to understand what's going on. That troubles me a great deal. Other uh, judges have used special masters um, to help them. They've been rejected at times. It's very expensive. I'd, I'd hope that the judges could give the lawyers a chance first to try it their way. And then if the lawyers aren't doing a good job, you always have another chance. Okay. Uh, Judge Michelle, is this something you see raised on appeal frequently, if at all, um, issues or disputes over the use 
of a neutral or an outside expert? Almost never. There's a lot of talk about it at conferences and in articles, but I very rarely see it done. And as far as I can tell, it, it, it doesn't need to be done, except maybe in some very unusual circumstance. From the standpoint of reading appellate records, my favorite expert witness is a university professor who's testified in some previous patent trials, knows the patent law background, and knows how to explain to non-scientists what's going mm -hmm. on in the, in the field. Okay. Ms. Benami, have you ever run into a situation where the judge has appointed a neutral over the objection of the parties? No, because the judges recognize the cost and how uncomfortable it makes everyone feel. Okay, and let me ask you one closing mm -hmm. question for this segment. If you were a judge, what do you think uh, would be the most important thing to hear from the experts? Where do you agree? Thank you, Ms. Benami. That concludes this part of the segment. We'll be back in a moment. Let's talk now a little about how Markman fits into the case as a whole. Judge Michelle, uh, often the way the court construes the patent is going to determine whether or not summary judgment will follow and be granted or denied. What does or should happen next? at the Court of Appeals. What are the chances, for example, of an interlocutory appeal at that stage? Well, as for interlocutory appeals, we've had several dozen requests, and uh, to date we've never granted one. So I guess we have to assume the prospects will be slim to none. I can't imagine a case, but I think it's a rare case, where it would be justified. Part of our problem is just that we already have a big backlog and this would only add to it mm -hmm. if we took those cases. Of course, if summary judgment is granted with respect to f f infringement overall, then uh, the losing party has a right to review uh, and then the claim construction is taken up immediately without uh, the expense of trial. But there may be a lot of cases where the trial can't be avoided. Do you think or do you see um, instances where you feel a summary judgment uh, has motion has been granted, um, perhaps on a somewhat shaky basis, simply to get it up to your court? It's hard to know exactly what all the circumstances were, but we, we do see some summary judgment cases where uh, the analysis is very shallow, uh, and that's uh, not helpful. And most of them, the analysis is very careful, and uh, we take it from there, and even though it's a de novo review, we re rely very mm -hmm. heavily on the analysis of the trial judge. Another issue that I know concerns a lot of trial judges is the perceived reversal rate when a case finally does get to the, the federal circuit. And, you know, there are comments that the reversal rate is 40 percent, 50 percent. Is that, in fact, accurate? And if so, is that unusual? Well, there's a, there's a footnote that says it's uh, uh, over 40 percent. And maybe it's a good illustration of the evil of footnotes and opinions. But uh, we have made a careful count in recent years of the actual reversal rate on just on claim construction. The overall reversal rate is around 45 percent on at least some issue, reversal in part. But reversal rate on claim construction is only about 25 percent. So the widely stated uh, reversal rate is actually not true. It's only half of what is said. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's good knowledge to know, and uh, I hope will be somewhat reassuring to uh, trial judges watching. Ms. Benami, what do you think the um, litigants think of the process as it, as it works now? What, what is their satisfaction or lack thereof? It's been an interesting development, because when Markman came out, the patent bar all said they'd be out of jobs. There'd be Markman hearings, and that would decide the entire case, and no one would mm -hmm. ever get to trial. The truth is that Markman is just a step in the process. Uh, it may lead to a finding of no literal infringement, but not likely to lead to a finding of no doctrine of equivalence infringement. It may raise more validity issues. But it's now just a staggered part of the process, and people look at that way. Well, another, another part of the process is uh, preliminary injunction motions. Judge Saris, how do you... Uh, mold that into the the case as a whole as far as timing and how you view them and approach them. Does it mean another hearing or set of hearings? Well that of course is your nightmare when your courtroom deputy comes in and says there's a group of attorneys downstairs that wants to have a preliminary injunction. 
uh, right away you're forcing all these careful measured steps that you have to construe a claim into a very rapid period of time. And I think that uh, enhances and makes it likely that you're going to make a mistake. So that my first goal would be to look at it and see if there are serious technology um, disputes, serious claim construction disputes. Do I even understand the technology well enough mm -hmm. to see whether it infringes? And if I can't make a genuine um, assessment that there's a likelihood of success, I go no further and I deny the motion for a preliminary injunction. I think that frustrates um, attorneys who think they're going to go in for a quick hit. And I know that time is money in a lot of these areas where the uh, if technology is moving so quickly. But the bottom line is we have to make sure that the likelihood of success is there, and that's too hard to do quickly. So I tend to not do that, but then I'll try and move the trial up much more quickly than I would otherwise do to, to get a faster resolution of it. And in general, the attorneys have been willing to work with me on that. Mm -hmm. Judge McKelvey, what's your experience on preliminary injunction The motions? experience in Delaware is pretty similar, which is, is I think it? the trial judges are pretty reluctant to grant preliminary mm -hmm. injunctions. I know when I get them, and they'll come in certain types of cases, pharmaceutical cases, electronics cases, uh, I try to talk to lawyers out of pr presenting a prompt preliminary injunction application under the theory that I'd like to give a defendant a little opportunity to take some discovery on validity defenses, among other things gives me more time to focus on the technology and other issues. So I'll see if early on we can talk to lawyers into having a uh, trial in the three or four months as opposed to 12 months. One of the little interplays here is between the trial judge making decisions on claim construction and on probability of success versus the parties presenting the case to a jury so that one of the issues is are the parties going to give up a right to a jury to get a prompt trial or will they hold off on it? Uh, Ms. Benami, what do you do strategically on this issue? When do you file preliminary injunction motions and why? Preliminary injunctions are successful where there's been a prior adjudication, usually. If somebody who had strong bargaining power went ahead and took a case and tried to invalidate a patent and it wasn't invalidated, it gives comfort to the judge. Where it's a real copyist, someone just took mm -hmm. your patent and just copied it. There can be circumstances where it's really necessary, but by and large, it says the judges have said the judges don't want to do it. On a biotech case, have you ever been involved in a case, either winning or losing, where a, a preliminary injunction was granted? I, I did have uh, one where we won, but the judge, it had been previously adjudicated, and the judge gave us a mini trial. So that's a little uh -huh. different situation. What about at your level, uh, Judge Michelle? Where, where do you see these, and how do you, if so, what is your reaction? We see a fair number uh -huh. of uh, preliminary injunctions, both granted and denied. Um, and of course, they're reviewed uh, for abuse of discretion, so that uh, they're rarely reversed on appeal, whichever way they came mm -hmm. out. And my, my rough impression is about half of them were granted and half of them were denied. So I, I, from that sense, I don't uh, think that it's rare for, for them to be granted. But it may be rare in particular technologies. Well, that was going to be my next question. Do you see that these occur more often in certain types of patents than in others? I, I think they occur where it's clear cut. Mm -hmm. An injunction will be granted where it's clear cut, whether you have outright copying uh, or where you have fairly simple technology so that you don't need a huge sensitive claim construction exercise before you can make a pretty good prediction of who's going to win at the eventual trial. So it's not the industry that's that's called the determining it, but really more the history of the litigation. I, I think it's more the facts of the case, although I think the more complex the technology, probably the, the less likely uh, to get an injunction. Let me ask you another question. When it comes to reviewing a case, um, what's your reaction when the findings or the, the judge's conclusions have been done orally from the bench versus a written opinion? Do you see major distinctions in the way the Federal Circuit views these cases? Well, uh, I don't know that I can uh, show a difference in the outcomes, but from the standpoint of our comfort level, I'd always rather have a written opinion, not necessarily terribly long, but written mm -hmm. rather than oral from the bench. There are some trial judges who are exceedingly good at, at being very, very clear and very thorough and still concise from the bench, but most people can give a much better explanation when they've had a chance to write it out. Okay. And now, finally, Judge McKelvey, um, you have a number of these cases that do go to trial. 
when you get to trial, what do you do with the claim construction? How do you use it in the trial itself? The, the place where I put claim construction is in the final jury instructions where we have the uh, claims set out. And I will, for example, after a particular words where there's been a dispute as to the meaning of the words, I'll put brackets in, uh, typing out the claims, put brackets in and say, by that we mean, or that is mm -hmm. the following. And then I'll quote it in the uh, jury instructions. All right. And in these cases, there are often a number of terms that are complicated. They're not common terms, but the parties don't have any dispute between themselves about what those terms mean. How do you let the jury know what those kinds of terms mean? Generally, we have uh, preliminary jury instructions that we give uh, the jury mm -hmm. at the beginning. And actually, we pass them out, type them up, and pass them out. And they'll have attached to them a glossary of terms, a glossary of technical terms where the parties agree on the meaning of the terms, while they may not be the types of words that the jury might understand. So we'll define them and agreed upon definition. And we'll actually also attach a glossary of uh, legal terms, such as, for example, the words file wrapper or other words that may come up during the course of the trial. All right. Thank you. We've come to the end of this program. While there are different views, some of the major conclusions are the following. First, timing for Markman hearings depends on the case. But generally speaking, the most optimal time will be after most discovery has been done, but well before the trial date. Second, judges need not be afraid of science. There are a variety of tools with which to learn, especially the experts. Utilize them all. Third, you have latitude and discretion to hear both intrinsic and extrinsic evidence. Just make sure that your findings point out what intrinsic evidence you utilized in order to reach your conclusions. As we said in the beginning, Although we've used a biotech case as a model, the concepts and principles discussed apply generally to all patent cases. The Federal Judicial Center is very grateful to all of our panelists for giving their time and sharing their experience with us. We hope this helps those of you who are watching and encourage you to check the FJTN Bulletin and the Center's DCN site for the schedule of other programs in this science series. On behalf of the FJC, thanks for watching.